Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me very great pleasure to welcome so many people here today to a packed room. Um, I'm Cathy Willis, I'm the principal here at St Evan Hall. And this is the first in our so-called conversations in environmental sustainability. Now there is obviously a colon, which is beyond greenwashing. So why are we doing this? Why have we started this, this, this series of conversations? We're gonna do one a term. A number of reasons. First of all, in 2019, we launched our strategy for the hall. And in that, we worked with the whole community within the college, from the fellows and the staff and the students to say, what do we want the hall to be known for? What does the hall, what does good look like in a hall of this size? And what came through really loud and clear from the student body upwards was that we wanted to be known as one of the most environmentally sustainable colleges in Oxford. So since that time, we've been working really hard on many things. We have uh, all sorts of gadgets and gizmos and different sorts of food types, et cetera, et cetera. And we've got a long way down that path of being much more environmentally sustainable in terms of our energy, in terms of our waste management, in terms of the way that we behave and the food that we eat. We've also just launched, um, we've just got planning commission for a passive house plus building for our student accommodation in Norham Gardens, which I have to say, and it sounds slightly boastful, but I'm very, very proud of this college in that it actually got through planning commission with a unanimous vote and was noted for the fact that it's, it's an exemplar in environmental sustainable design. But the one thing we hadn't tackled, partly because of COVID, is we hadn't tackled that piece that's so critical. We're here to do education and research, and it's pulling together people to have those discussions about environmental sustainability. Now, there are many, many discussions going on in Oxford about environmental sustainability, but often it's a one hour lecture with a few questions at the end and everyone then goes away. We wanted to do something different. We wanted to create a conversation where we'd invite four people all to address the same question and then to have a discussion afterwards. The discussion and the conversation with everybody in the room. So today, our first one is the question is, uh, uh, I have to remember the question myself, where's the innovation in renewable energy? Because we hear so much about all of these different sorts of renewable energies. But the key question really is, which one should we all be investing in? What should we, we be trying to do as a college, as a community, as a city, in terms of renewable energies. So I have four speakers here who are, I will introduce in one moment. Each has been given 12 minutes to give their pitch to convince you that this is the renewable energy of the future. So please be thinking about those questions when they're speaking. And then at the end, everyone will come up on the stage and then we'll have a good 30 minutes or so for discussion. And then there's glasses of wine at the end and you can then ask them individual questions as you so wish. Anyway, so our four speakers here today, and I'm very, very grateful for all of them who've, who've come. So we've got uh, David Byron, who's um, gonna to talk to us about uh, nuclear fusion and is the a CFO of, of First Life Light Fusion. There's Carlos Monreal. Now this is gonna be really interesting because he's talking about plastic energy from recycling plastic. Another one of these topics that quite often is there somewhere on the radar, but not center stage. We've then got William Rowe, who's the founder and CEO of Octopus Hydrogen. And finally, we've got Richard Wilden, who's a professor or fellow in college, who's gonna talk about the work that Oxford's doing and his group in particular are doing on wave and tidal energy and wind energy. So without further ado, I'm gonna ask uh, David to come up and start us off with the first of these four topics. David, thank you. Targets. We've got the key clean, affordable, 
scalable as human power. And this can be great, great investment for our shareholders, but also a great solution for our energy needs and for the planet. Cheese is complicated, but don't worry, I'll keep this simple. When I say simple, I mean as simple as possible. And this is the golden thread that runs through everything we do at First Life Fusion. Fusion power by the simplest machine possible. There we go, right, back on, back on track. Simple is good, simple is cost effective, simple is deployable. As simple as possible is the way we'll make fusion power work. First Light is Oxford University's fusion energy spin out. Born in the engineering department, we have a fabulous and talented team, an amazing advisory board, and day in, day out, we undertake groundbreaking science and engineering in pursuit of near limitless human power. We have constructed a full shock physics lab here in Oxford where we rapidly iterate and test our designs and concepts. We have built some amazing kit. This is our gun, the BFG, the big frenzy gun. It is 22 meters long and accelerates projectiles to seven kilometers per second. It is just one of our platforms that pushes the barriers of what can be done. It was here in Oxford that just over a year ago we demonstrated Is that better? Yes. Great. And most importantly, it is where we write and run our simulation codes that, uniquely in the field, simulate every aspect of what we do, allowing us to use best-in-class machine learning to optimize our designs and systems. It's a good thing I've got two hands. Oh, wait. And here is our inertial fusion concept in the simplest diagram possible. We launch a projectile at hypervelocities. This projectile delivers a kinetic energy to our target, which takes the incoming shock wave and rapidly collapses the fuel capsule, creating the conditions necessary for fusion. But what is fusion? The sun, of course, is a fusion reactor, a very, very large, very inefficient fusion reactor, relying on the immense gravity to function. We don't have this space, we don't have the gravity on Earth. We need creative methods to generate fusion on Earth. Fusion is the joining together of light elements to form heavier elements. In doing this, energy is released in the form of a neutron. Mass is exchanged for energy. Three things are needed for fusion, or three things interplay in fusion, temperature, density, and time. Temperature is needed to overcome the repulsion between particles. It must be hot, very, very hot. Temperature and time can be traded off against each other, but together these determine how many opportunities you have to fuse. Low density, long time, or like first light fusion, high density, very short space of time. Many things can be fused, but the easiest reaction is between deuterium and tritium, both isotopes of hydrogen. Of all the fuels, this requires the lowest temperature to give the highest energy yield. Deuterium is found in water. This glass of water here, we can, if full, sorry, it's only half full, if full, would contain enough water to power a house for an entire year. There are broadly two main approaches to fusion, magnetic, and inertial, with, a, with, with flavors in between as well. Magnetic fusion holds plasmas together in a magnetic bottle. Like a furnace, it burns continuously and you just keep adding fuel. Inertial fusion is different. It's a pulsed process, more like an internal combustion engine. The spark plug, which we call the driver, puts the energy into the system. The fusion event happens, releasing a burst of energy, and then you repeat. Gain is the key metric here, getting more energy out than you put in. Magnetic fusion has demonstrated a gain of 0.7. It hasn't yet crossed the key threshold. Inertial fusion has. 
1.5 was achieved by the US's National Ignition Facility late last year. This is a big deal. It shows the conditions for fusion energy can be uh, achieved in a power plant environment. Inertial fusion works. But why do we need fusion? Well, we need to change how we power the world. Electrification is key both to help decarbonize and to provide improved living standards to poorer parts of the world. Electricity demand will surge in the next 30 years. So what should we do? Well, we should be deploying as much wind, solar, tide, clean tech as we can. As much as we can, as quickly as we can. But is this the whole solution? Regrettably, not. Intermittent technologies have fundamental um, limitations on deployment rates and cost. We think there's a clean energy gap. If we rely wholly on these technologies, carbon fuels will endure and fill that gap. This cannot happen. We need clean base load power, and the obvious choices for this are fission and fusion. Fission, traditional nuclear, is problematic. It struggles because of three main problems. The existential safety issue, meltdown is bad, very, very bad. Long-lived waste, no one wants to pay for it, no one wants to live near it. And proliferation, bad things can be done with fission fuel. Fusion is different. It is intrinsically safer. You cannot get meltdown. It has lower level manageable waste and it doesn't have a fuel that can be weaponized. This will make fusion more acceptable to the public and the regulators allowing fusion to get built and to generate cheap electricity. So why don't we have fusion power yet? Well, the investment into fusion has until recently been too small to deliver significant results. Even now, as a major hurdle has been surmounted, there remain further challenges. Firstly, the driver used at the National Ignition Facility, a high energy laser, is far, far too expensive for commercial power. Secondly, there are some significant engineering challenges. Neutrons, for example, damage structural steel, much like sunlight damages plastic pots you leave in your garden over summer. The steel starts to crumble. This creates a massive operational and cost issue for many fusion technologies. The publicly funded programs have pathways to address this, but there's a long way to go. First Light has a pathway to address both the engineering and the cost and a way to enable rapid deployment of reactors. There are five reasons why we think this is. Firstly, core physics of inertial fusion has been proven. The National Ignition Facility has shown this. We know which fuel capsules work. Problem one solved. But the NIF research does not lend itself to a reactor. It's too expensive, too complicated. But we can use all that is good from NIF and turn it into a functioning power plant technology. How? We use our unique amplifier as a wrapper around this fuel capsule. Our amplifiers do two things. They amplify velocity. They take an incoming velocity and they create an output velocity that's many times higher than that. They also create Convergence, wrapping a shockwave around the target to create a spherical collapse. Just like NIF, but crucially with a shockwave that comes from only one side. I'll talk about this later. Convergence is hard to demonstrate, but I can demonstrate amplification. Yeah, much like double bouncing on a trampoline, um, you get a transfer of energy from the big, slow thing to the small, light thing. 
There is an efficiency cost to amplification. Uh, nothing comes for free, um, but we overcome this with a cheap source of energy, the spark plug for this reaction. Pulse power is that source of cheap energy. We could use a laser to drive the shock wave, much like the National Ignition Facility. However, pulse power is three orders of magnitude cheaper in delivered energy than a laser. And is easier to build. And this is, in many ways, a simple machine. OK, back to my point on the uh, one-sided drive. The amplifier allows one-sided drive. This is crucial as it unlocks a simplified engineering concept that bypasses the main challenges of fusion. Others need to solve these hard challenges. We don't have to. This then becomes a power plant that can be mainly built with existing technologies. Here you see an animation of the fusion island. This is where the, uh, the fusion event happens, where things get hot. By using a liquid metal wall, much like a shower curtain, we protect the key components of the plant from the damaging neutrons. We also manage the heat flux. The heat from fusion is extraordinarily hot. And critically, we have enough surface area exposed to neutrons to produce the tritium we need for generating half of the fuel. Three challenges, one solution. And then the final piece of the puzzle is the business model. First light shall manufacture and supply targets to the power stations. That is all. This is a low capex, high margin business uh, and in addressing a $1.6 trillion dollar annual market, this can create a valuable business. But much like Nespresso, we won't be building the machines that will use our targets. We want maximum scalability. If we tried to do this self, we would limit the rate of deployment of the reactors and slow the whole thing down. But because we are reusing existing technologies or adjacent technologies, existing supply chains can deploy the reactors, the drivers, the fusion islands, the balance of plants. The companies who build power plants today can build our power plants tomorrow. So I have one final equation for you. This is a simple one. Add together, demonstrated target physics, wrap it in first light's amplifier technology, drive the reaction with a pulse power machine, leverage one sided dry to simplify the engineering, add a scalable business model, and what do you get? Well, you get to understand why we believe that inertial fusion power is coming. Thank you. So thank you very much for a very good first start. Um, we've got time for one question. If there's one burning question directly related to this. Burning question. But, uh, burning question. When, when, when's it coming? Yeah. <laughs> Did everyone hear at the back this, when's it coming? <laughs> so, so yeah, we think, we think it will be here in a decade. P uh, power plants, pilot plants on the grid producing electrons, if everything goes well. Okay, thank you very much. So our next renewable energy we're going to hear about is, uh, we're going to hear from Carlos Monrell, who's going to talk about plastic energy. Carlos. I think so. Good afternoon, everyone. This is, I hope that this is uh, for a Friday afternoon, Friday evening. You are ready to, uh, to try to understand the uh, uh, special English coming from Spain. So my name is Carlos Monreal. I'm the CEO of Plastic Energy and the founder of the company back in 2011. And uh, I'm going to be talking today mainly about plastics, but I thought that it was going to be important to Establish uh, first a framework of uh, where we are in the development uh, of new uh, clean tech technologies. As uh, mainly you will see here in the presentation, there are few areas that I think are going to be very important during 2023. And the 
One of them clearly is the global uh, clean tech race that we are facing right now, particularly after the USA launched in December their uh, Inflection Reduction Act that is really going to mobilize almost $400 billion to invest into clean tech uh, technologies. That is going to be the first one. Second, it will be energy prices are going to continue affecting really the, uh, the situation of the industry with prices that are continuing to be escalated and will continue it most likely through 2024. The other part is going to be access to different type of commodities of materials that are totally necessary for doesn't matter if we are going to produce solar panels or any of the other type of batteries that is going to be important and that is going to be affected by different regulations where they are going to try to control the export of valuable commodities to be used for clean tech technologies. Fourth is going to be water problems. You see, we uh, are just finishing, the, uh, we just finished a 2022 summer that they, where Europe had uh, extremely uh, severe, se severe uh, challenges in the uh, water scarcity. And that is something that is really going to be critical for the future, how we are going to be developing technologies that will be able to really process water and be able to keep the resource within the environment. Fourth, food concerns, where you will see, or fifth, where uh, the Ukraine uh, war is really going to continue to help to increase uh, prices across the, the value chain. That's not going to stop. It's not going to only affect the inflation, but that, that is really something that we are going to have to face for the future. And lastly, obviously, what we want to do with our planet. Something that is going to be important, and you heard the presentation before, Everything takes time. In any type of technologies, moving from the uh, startup to have uh, those technologies ready for scale up, that takes time. That takes capital, requests permitting, and uh, requests a lot of support from the different entities. So, how we could be able to scale up different type of technologies related to clean tech that normally are extremely capex intensive. So. Just a couple of months ago, we uh, was created a new coalition that is the uh, Clean Tech for Europe that is going to try to really uh, support and promote uh, uh, how we are going to be able to react to the Inflation Reduction Act, mainly by mobilizing uh, huge volumes of uh, capital that, that will be announced next week in, the, in Europe. And uh, also second, more, more important, is going to be how to facilitate and fast track permitting for new uh, technologies, because that normally takes up to two to three years to be able to get permitting. Normally, capital you could be able to secure it, but permitting normally is later, is coming later than capital. And that is something that cannot be possible. You will see in this coalition, it's open to for other companies representing the, uh, technology companies that are in a scale phase, both from the uh, hydrogen to energy storage, uh, CO2 capture, recycling. And this one example of different technologies that are important. And I, I will uh, invite you to check out uh, the webpage, uh, Clean Tech for Europe, because it will give you very good information about it. But now let's focus on what uh, we do in plastic energy. Uh, plastics, we've been talking uh, about waste plastics for many years. Reality is that is, uh, we produce more than 400 million tons of waste plastics per year globally. That is something that is a pity, because it's a very valuable resource that could be able to put a, a will be put back to value and if it will be possible to use different type of technologies. The other thing that is also important is that the, uh, the waste uh, plastic system or the plastic uh, life cycle generates more than 1.8 billion tons of C uh, uh, green gas, uh, uh, greenhouse emissions. And that is something that clearly we have to try to see how we can uh, manage. And the, diff the problem, that the, because the plastic is a, such a good, great material that, by the way, is a, has a better life cycle analysis on a lower CO2 footprint than other alternative materials like glass or paper or carton, regardless of what the, the media could say, that is only a technical uh, validation. However, reality, plastic has a bad image. And the reason for that is mainly because we recover less than, let's say, 14% recycling rates globally and that is a real pity when, for example, we are recycling more than 80, 75 to 80% of papers, glass, or carton. And that is mainly because the industry 
got together already 25 years ago and started to invest in the proper infrastructure to do the, the right collection of paper, glass, uh, glass and, uh, and carton that the oil companies have not done and have not started only until a few years ago. I'm going to, uh, I don't know if it will be possible, I don't know if it works or not, yes. That whenever we see plastics or we talk about waste plastics, we think plastics is the problem. But we have to remember that the plastics really represents less than 15% of the total waste that we daily generate. So whenever we see plastics, we have to think that it's something like about 10 times that plastics of waste that is contaminating the environment. This is clearly an easy, easy example. This is in the city of Jakarta, the largest landfill, but we have also landfills here in the UK. And we are contributing just to different gas emissions from the landfills, not coming from plastics, but really coming from the organic waste that we generate. In this place in London, it's a similar population than London, and they generate every single day almost 8,000 tons of plastics going to the landfill. More than 7,000 people are trying to collect every single day about 1,000 tons of plastics faster than the excavators that you saw, that they are trying to move the plastics and the waste from the bottom all the way up before the bulldozers on the top uh, can uh, spread uh, the waste. So what can we do, they say, in particular, in only for 10, 15% of the waste, which is plastics? Is the, so far right now, what we are doing is a, a mainly do what is called mechanical recycling. Mechanical recycling is mainly to follow, is what you can see there, follows the, the ar a yellow uh, arrow, which is mainly uh, focused in bottles, which are easy to collect, easy, uh, easily to, to process, and has a big demand from the many different industries like the textile industry. That is, however, that only represents globally less than 14% of the plastics collected. Most of the rest of the plastics, they follow the red line, which is mainly take those plastics to either landfill, incineration, that only in Europe are responsible the incineration industry for 38 million tons of CO2 emissions. That is something that after 2027, that is going to be penalized, and clearly that is going to motivate the incineration industry to divert plastics, which is the source of the uh, emissions that they are generating. So that would be something important. But what, would, what do we do with the technology that we developed already back in 2011 is mainly to move those plastics from incineration landfill or the, uh, uh, to process it back to oil and use that uh, oil, which is like a NAFTA, in order to replace fossil oil feedstocks to produce new plastics. And that is really what, they, what we do. Why it's important is mainly because you will see increased recycling rates significantly because we are addressing more than 80% of the plastics that are not uh, currently being recycled. In the other hand, is also we can incorporate those plastics back into food grade applications, as you will see later on, uh, for packaging, and mainly reduce CO2 emissions of alternative solutions like incineration. Plastic Energy, uh, we develop a, a patented technology that it has been in the market now for the, uh, the last 12 years. Is that we have a couple of plants operating in Spain, and as you will see later on, several plants under construction, that right now with a pipeline of projects of over $1 billion in CAPEX to be invested over the next three years. Mainly, we are focusing, well, I'm going to present the video if I have time, Humans have always developed technologies to improve the quality of living. Plastics have enabled us to reach space, have improved agricultural production and enabled food and water to be distributed in a more hygienic way. They've also revolutionized healthcare and helped to save lives every day. However, our lifestyle also generates serious problems due to the ways in which we use plastics. With a life cycle of less than 12 minutes, the plastics that we use and throw away every day are rarely recycled and end up piling up in landfills or in our oceans and rivers forever. It is estimated that our oceans hold in excess of 150 million tons of plastic and that almost 70% of the seafood we normally consume has traces of microplastics. If we continue in this direction, by 2050, there'll be more plastic than fish in the sea and the situation on land will further worsen. 
How can we manage this plastic wave which threatens our planet's existence? Plastic Energy has been working to find a solution over the last 10 years. And today, we have good news to share. Thanks to a unique process, we've been able to recycle the plastics no one wants and which cannot be mechanically recycled to obtain taka oil. It's an oil which can be used to produce new plastics with a low carbon footprint. This technology reduces fossil fuel consumption used to create virgin plastic. This is not science fiction, it's not a project or a dream. It's a reality which is already up and running 24-7, 365 days a year at our plants in Almería and Seville in Spain. It allows people to continue enjoying the advantages of plastic while minimizing its detrimental effect on the environment. This is a new hope for plastic recycling which we would like to bring to the entire world and a process which has made us world leaders in the circular economy of non-mechanically recycled plastic. We've created a new technology which is making a big change. A change which on a daily basis inspires and motivates our employees in London, Almería, Seville, and which will enable us to jointly make a difference in a world where using plastic will no longer be a threat. A technology which will help us look after our cherished planet. Plastic energy. Technology to recycle our future. But uh, this uh, cannot be done alone. And it's uh, very important to be able to integrate, to incorporate the whole uh, uh, value chain. Uh, we are participating with different initiatives that uh, some of them uh, will be uh, known by, the, uh, by you. This is with the uh, Ellen MacArthur Foundation to uh, are part uh, of uh, one of the signatories of the, uh, trying to uh, incorporate recycled plastic within the uh, different type of packaging or the UK plastic cut, uh, the sustainability uh, packaging and uh, we created the, clean, the uh, Chemical Recycling Association of Europe, uh, incorporating other type of technologies that could be able to address other type of plastics. And at the end of the day, what I was saying at the beginning, the Clean Tech for Europe, which is mainly an association to a coalition to try to put together different companies that are ready to scale up and be able to uh, lobby in, in, on behalf of those companies to be able to mobilize capital and at the same time to be able to uh, facilitate permitting. Examples, just to uh, don't think that this is uh, something uh, strange, uh, some examples of products that you are using every single day, like the Magnum ice cream packaging or the Philadelphia cheese packaging, they are currently being made out of our facilities and that are being by recycling waste plastics converted into uh, NAFTA that we sell into the, petrochem to the petrochemical companies and uh, after that they um, produce the uh, plastics that can be used again for those type of applications. This is clearly is a great opportunity, but this is, uh, you could see, the, every single plant uh, has a request a capex of over $100 million. It takes up to three years to be, to be built. We have, uh, as I was saying at the beginning, the more than $1 billion the, uh, dollars right now under different phases of construction and they we're trying to select uh, projects in the specific in different geographies in order to have a global footprint and be able to have the right benchmark in different countries that could be able to be used for companies to replicate the technology how we are going to be building a few plants ourselves and but clearly more than uh, in this moment more than the, uh, 35 billion dollars are going to have to be requested to invest in CAPEX over the next only five years. Clearly, we do not have that capital. So what we are, going to, what we are doing is mainly select locations, build a few plants, and then license the technology to the petrochemical companies that they could be able to use the technology, proven technology, use their balance sheet, that, by the way, only a couple of oil companies this year, as you know, they have generated more than $100 billion in, the, in free cash flow only in 2022. So that is important. And this is mainly the, uh, what we can do. And I finish with this slide. It's the, the important from a sustainability point of view, which is really producing plastics using this type of technology is, has a lower uh, CO2 footprint, more than 55% lower 
than using fossil oil feed stocks to produce those plastics. So that is also very important that we are also trying to, to address. Thank you for your time. So thank you, thank you very much. Um, we've got time for one question, if there's one burning question. There's a question just here. <coughs> can I ask, um, the plastic that is uh, floating at the moment in the oceans, can this also be recycling, uh, recycled in your facilities? Is the, can you repeat the question? The, the floating plastic in the oceans today, yeah. can this be recycled? Uh, uh, yes, it can be, uh, uh, if it is collected, can be recycled. The problem that the degradation and the quality of that uh, plastic normally is not that good, but uh, it can be recycled. The question is not really to try to have to invest in collection plastics on the sea, but to avoid those plastics going to the sea. It's like a, it's really the going into the a, a CO2 capture. If we could avoid and we could be able to focus what plants and the big a, assets are generating the, this CO2 and we could be able to avoid the CO2 being emitted, it will really simplify it and the, the business model over time it will be much, much better. Brilliant. So we've had plastics, we've had nuclear fusion, and now we're going to move on to green hydrogen. So we have uh, William Rowe, who's the founder and CEO of um, Octopus, Hyd yes, Octopus Hydrogen, who's going to be talking to us about yet another renewable energy. William. As we'll come on in a minute, I'm not 100% sure. They're not the, the best slides anyway. Well, there you go. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for having me. So I guess just first and foremost, basically to give you a bit of background as to what we're going to talk about, I'm going to try to talk you through a kind of hydrogen 101. So for those of you who know a lot about hydrogen, apologies in advance for those that don't know much, please give me feedback at the end as to whether this was the right level of detail because I'm conscious hydrogen is one of those things that some people know a lot about and some people know very little about. So starting at the start, Hydrogen. There's a lot of hydrogen used today in the world, um, and it's kind of used for two core things. So let's get into what it's used for right now. So typically, hydrogen is used for, um, to make ammonia, so i.e. to we take hydrogen that comes from natural gas, we combine it with an atmospheric nitrogen, and we make ammonia that's used for things like fertilizer and other uh, downstream chemical processes. And the other thing we use hydrogen for is in refined, oh, that, sorry, that, that one's ammonia and that's refinery. The other thing we do with it is it's used within the um, production of oil products, so typically to make kerosene or petroleum, etc. We use a lot of hydrogen to desulfurize and also to improve or hydrogenate the uh, oil to make it into different things. Kind of back to chemistry 101. I just wanted to make sure. Now the problem with all that hydrogen that's there is it all comes from 99.8% um, of the world's hydrogen right now comes from natural gas. So it's very high CO2 emissions, they're totally unabated, there's no carbon capture or anything like that. Um, but it is a very widely used thing. And then you get into this whole rainbow of what colours of hydrogen there could be. So the one I've been talking about is grey hydrogen. And sorry, just to go back, that's how you make it, steam methane reforming. So you blast hot water on natural gas and you get hydrogen out and a load of CO2. Um, but the key thing is, is this whole rainbow of hydrogens that's like super confusing because ultimately, most of them don't matter. The point is, you've got grey hydrogen that's really dirty and we use loads of it today. You've got blue hydrogen, which I'll talk about, and you've got green hydrogen. Now, blue hydrogen isn't a terrible idea. I want to put that out there to start with because what blue hydrogen is, is effectively it's grey hydrogen where we try and capture as much of the CO2 as possible. Now, the negative of, of blue hydrogen is we still maintain having to use a lot of methane in the world and methane emissions are bad and you know much worse from a CO2 perspective so you know you can't give methane a kind of methane slash natural gas is you can't give that an easy ride you've got to be careful what that what, what we do there and the second is obviously the carbon capture rates are not perfect because if they were we'd, we would do it a lot more they're relatively they're probably between 70 and 90 percent depending on the technology my personal big gripe with blue hydrogen isn't that bit you know let's say you know we need an energy source that's you know, natural gas is much better than coal, for example, and if we could use hydrogen um, where we've captured 60% of the CO2, that's probably a net, what is clearly a net win. My problem with blue hydrogen, as we see in the UK typically, 
is that the plan is to say, rather than add carbon capture onto existing grey hydrogen, the plan is to build brand new blue hydrogen facilities and keep the grey ones running. So um, us as taxpayers need to then fund those in order to prove that the blue hydrogen is viable. Now, as everyone knows, you know, oil and gas companies make plenty of money at the moment. My argument would be if they really cared, you could definitely build blue hydrogen facilities on all your existing grey hydrogen stuff easily. And you don't need taxpayers' money to do it. It's just a case of willingness. The green hydrogen, on the other hand, is produced through electrolysis. So what that is, is you take, I'm trying to remember if I put a slide on this. No, oh, that was my no, no blue, that was that one. <laughs> so green hydrogen, on the other hand, it, so that, that's the, um, that's why we take electricity. You could argue basically low carbon electricity. So I would say from wind and solar, geothermal, but you know, nuclear, basically I, I would class it as anything with a, you see, see a very negligible CO2 impact and we, t and we take that and we produce hydrogen through electrolysis. And electrolysis is a super simple process. Uh, everyone always says you did it at school, but we didn't do it at the school I went to. Um, <laughs> simply just messed around with Bunsen burners. Um, probably methane related. Um, but basically all you do is you've got anode and a cathode in water, kind of like the same as a battery and you put current through it and hydrogen comes off and so does oxygen. Now, effectively, an electrolyzer does that at bigger and bigger scales. You capture the hydrogen, let the oxygen go off to atmosphere, and you have hydrogen. So the beauty of that is, in theory, it's, I would say, limitless. <laughs> but let's say, okay, you need a source of water, because if you use salty water, um, you produce chlorine gas, so it, it doesn't work. And you need electricity. And as long as the electricity was green, it's a very sensible way to produce hydrogen. Sounds great, right? Everyone's now going thinking, great, loads of water, electricity is cheap, we can make loads of hydrogen. Now, there's only one problem with that, and that, which is you've got to think carefully about what you're going to use your hydrogen for. Because for most things, and as we've touched on already, you know, we have a huge climate crisis, electrification is by far the best solution for most things. So if you need electricity, you probably, what well, I would say, almost always should use electricity from a renewable source or let's say if nuclear gets to the right sort of levelised cost of production, but de generally use it as electricity. But the problem with electricity is it's time-based. You can't store electricity. You, know, you can store it in a lithium battery, but really you kind of have to use it when it's generated. That's kind of the whole point of electricity. And so the challenge of that is ultimately we don't have fixed demand for electricity, whether that be you know, electric vehicles or heating homes as we move into that or industrial processes, so our, our demand fluctuates throughout time. So having enough electricity available to do all the things we want to do is challenging at the right time. And the way we've solved that historically has been you build massive thermal generation plants, so coal or gas-fired effectively, and you can flex the output of those. On, and, and also generally, ultimately, they're so big and the inertia in the grid is so large that you kind of don't have to worry about the individual marginal lights coming on here and there. That was the whole point of you know, when we built the first <coughs> electricity networks. So anyway, I'm a huge fan of electrification through renewables, and it's a really important and critical step. And the reason why we started the business was because, frankly, <laughs> we're looking at good ideas in the electricity space, and we're like, well, there's not a lot of good businesses left in electricity because there's a lot of good companies doing things. You've got Teslas, you've got EV chargers, you know, like grid serves business model. There's lots of businesses that are doing great stuff, and I was like, well, what can we do? If we really like electricity, but we want to do something that's good for the planet, but we also don't want to play in a playground that's really busy. And we had a look and we're like, oh, hydrogen's great because it needs electricity, but it also isn't super busy. And actually, it turns out getting cheap electricity is the key thing in when you want to make hydrogen. So, right, back onto the, the core point. Okay, so the reason why you've got to be careful of hydrogen is because it's not a panacea to everything in the world. It is a, is a, a fuel that, by definition, will cost more than the renewable electricity that produced it. And that's the key thing to remember. And a guy called Michael Liebreich, um, who created Bloomberg New Energy Finance, um, has this ladder, which is pretty good. What, so what this is meant to be doing is effectively telling you you've got unavoidable uses of hydrogen at the top and uncompetitive uses of hydrogen down the bottom. And what he's saying is, as we kind of touched on, so fertilizer, i.e. ammonia, um, hydrogenation, which is refinery stuff. Well, I think that might be hydrocacking, and then you've got hydrogenation of oil to make food stuff, I think you make um, margarine. It's not my strong point, this, this <laughs> row. <laughs> um, and then you can work your way down into things that are clearly, in his view, very, very unlikely to ever be a sensible use case for hydrogen. So he would put cars in there, urban delivery, which I can definitely see, right? I mean, there's loads of people already gone there in electric vans, so how is a hydrogen van for driving around Oxford going to compete? I just don't see it. Um, and then you've got the stuff in the middle, which is, yeah, now what's interesting is, I guess the way the world of the kind of hydrogen debate has landed is basically, if we're not doing these ones here, it's crazy. 
I'm not sure that's quite true. Equally, if, you're focused, if your business model only focuses on the bottom rung, I think you've probably got a challenge just generally in the medium term because I can't see how it remains competitive. Um, it's not my diagram, it's Michael Libre, so if you want to find it, just Google it. So what do we do? So I think we focus on the good. I've not got an ugly, I've just got good and bad. Um, so the ones, I won't keep going back because it'll get confusing. The applications that we think make a lot of sense is displacing the current grey hydrogen that's used in things like semiconductor manufacturing. So anything where we use grey hydrogen today, where the scale can be achieved with green hydrogen today. And there's lots of people working on businesses that look at green hydrogen production for chemicals or the refinery side. But my issue with those, just from a business perspective, is they are typically kind of 20, 30 kind of projects. And that's a long way away and a lot of PowerPoint for a lot of years. And we wanted to do something a bit quicker. So we focus on the applications that kind of are happening now. So you've got the grey hydrogen displacement, and that's really important. And then you've got some other applications that are starting to, to, starting to be viable. So non-road based machinery. So things like excavators, diesel gen sets, which is a power unit here. Um, so I, where we're using a liquid based fuel um, and electrification is very unlikely to get there. That makes a lot of sense. And then, you know, some people think it's controversial. I'm not sure it is, but HGVs. So the HGVs, I think for me, the answer will be, you're probably looking at, it'll be somewhere between 10% and 50% hydrogen. So there'll be an awful lot of electric HGVs and then there'll be a chunk that might be hydrogen. I can't think it'll go down synthetic diesel because it's incredibly energy intensive to make that. So that's, that's what we do. Um, I won't go into those ones, but as you could guess, they're at the bottom of the ladder. The big one, I guess, in the UK, just to point out there is hydrogen for domestic heat. So, you know, look, we've all been spoiled for a long time that the UK had natural gas offshore, so did the Netherlands, a few places, and we decided to heat our homes using gas. And you've got to remember, before that, we were using coal you take coal in and it's dirty and you get soot in your chimneys and it was you know it wasn't a great way to heat your home so natural gas was a huge win for society it's lower co2 clean pretty safe let's say relatively safe not i don't think it's any less safe than coal anyway um and so now there's this whole debate of what's going to happen in the uk are we going to go down the route of using hydrogen to heat our homes and there's trials going on at the moment to <clears throat> to blend hydrogen into the pipe so because methane is CH4, you can in theory blend hydrogen in and you can get a 20% blend and that reduces the CO2. The challenge of blending in my, well, the two challenges of blending. One is um, because of the volumetric nature of hydrogen, it is very uh, spacious. <laughs> you put a lot of hydrogen in pipes, um, but it doesn't displace as much natural gas as you'd hope. So effectively, you put 20% hydrogen into the pipes, but you only end up saving about 6% on the CO2 side. So it's an awful lot of stuff going in for not a lot of CO2 savings. And the other one really is we just need to get on and start electrifying. So we need to insulate our homes better and we need to have heat pumps and whether those be ground source or air source into most homes. And we need to stop kind of keeping the debate alive. And then whatever's left in 2050, we can solve, you know, is kind of my view of it rather than kind of, yeah, kind of giving the gas network and an extra 10 years of revenue. So that's controversial by the way, so that's the, in the hydrogen space. <laughs> okay, and then the other, the other key one, and this is one that I'm super passionate about, is you'll see on Michael's ladder, and I'm trying to remember where it is now. Um, anyone spot long duration energy storage? B. There you go, B. Oh, at least it's pretty close. Um, so, B. So that's the one that we're, we're really passionate about. So. Um, the beauty of renewable electricity is when you've got lots of wind and lots of solar, they are incredibly cheap relative to other forms of electricity. The challenge is when it's not sunny or it's not windy, <laughs> they are materially a lot more expensive than the alternative because they're not there. Um, and so the way we'll solve this problem and, you know, uh, typically acknowledged across most places is to overbuild the renewables. So we'll have lots more wind than we need and we'll take advantage of it by trying to shift demand into the periods where we've got that wind. Um, and the same. I'd say the same with solar, but I guess we live in the UK, so let's, you know, ish with solar. But the idea is we're going to build a lot more renewables we need, and we're going to have a lot more, so we're going to have oversupply at periods, and we're going to have, but you will have periods where you don't have enough. And so we'll do things like we'll interconnect with, you know, uh, Norway, Ireland, Iceland, I think there's one to France. There's, there's a lot of interconnectors that come, but that's not going to be enough on its own. So what, what else are we going to do? And one of the, what we focus on as a business is we produce hydrogen ch ch chasing that marginal electron, so the spare electron. So when we have an abundance of energy, our view is that it's a great time to make hydrogen. 
That's not my alarm, is it? No. Um, and then conversely, then the key thing is trying not to produce hydrogen when you don't have enough renewable electricity, because then you're effectively a parasitic load on the grid and you are you know, using the coal or the, or the natural gas-fired power stations. And it's worth pointing out, you know, the UK's grid has gone a long way. So of all the grids in the world that don't have large hydro reserves, the UK has got relatively far on the journey of decarbonisation, but we still use 50% of our electricity comes from gas peakers because effectively when we don't have enough wind, we turn on loads of gas peakers. Now, getting through that and saying, okay, we're going to have a lot more wind soon, but we're never going to get 100% wind coverage all the time. What are we going to do? So there's a, there's a lot of talk around, could we use hydrogen? Could we combust that hydrogen to generate electricity in those gaps where we don't have wind? It's kind of a... I've kind of forgotten the nuclear person on the panel, but it's kind of a, let's see which wins out, right? So is nuclear going to win out as the cheapest low carbon source of sort of base load power? Or is it going to be a blend of overproduction of wind, as it will be in the UK, and producing hydrogen and then going back through the cycle? And it's an interesting thing to debate. Um, and that's the end of my slide. So hopefully that's everything on hydrogen. <laughs> um, I think I'll get one question. So is there one question? There's one at the back. Um, we'll just bring the mic down, it might be easier. Okay, sorry, um, I'm a layman here, so just could you briefly explain why you think cars are in that rightful place at the bottom? Because there are plenty of people out there who hold out for hydrogen cars rather than uh, the electric ones. Uh, yeah, so I guess um, there's, a, there's a lot of reasons, but I guess if I was touching on the core one, so ultimately, like, the, the beauty of fossil fuels has been that they are energy dense from a kind of weight perspective and simple to handle. So, you know, gasoline or diesel, you can put it in a relatively cheap container, just stick it through an internal combustion engine, which is pretty inefficient, really, but nonetheless, like, you know, it, it kind of works pretty well. And the, the, But the point of... But the challenge we've got is, okay, so right now, as a relatively early adopter of EVs, we don't get all of the same things, right? So lithium isn't as energy dense as the, 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 the petrol we use when you combine it with that. But electric cars are just so efficient. They are, for every electron you generate, you get 90% of that energy back into usable work done in terms of road miles achieved. And hydrogen, on the other hand, you've got to turn it into hydrogen in the first place, then you've got to take that hydrogen and put it back. So effectively, it's somewhere between 40 and 60% efficient round trip, maybe it's even slightly lower than that, but let's be generous and say 40%. So it's only applications where you cannot get there for electrification that that very poor efficiency is gonna be offset and kind of make it worthwhile, is my view. Because you're effectively using twice the price, so it'd be like the electricity costing twice as much. And so for me, it'll just come down to the economics and that efficiency point. And so you could argue, okay, so what happens if we can import hydrogen at incredibly low cost, producing geographies that were incredibly low cost. I, I guess maybe I just really struggle to kind of imagine a kind of export driven hydrogen economy where there's been very cheap molecules existing. I think it will always be more than electricity. And so any economy that's looking to build its strategy on the cost of energy that was produced in one place and then exported by hydrogen to another, I just think it's, it's gonna be a difficult battle. Thank you very much. Thank you. So our last speaker, before we have the, uh, the whole panel debate, is uh, Professor Richard Walden, from, uh, who is a fellow here in, in Teddy Hall, and is going to talk about offshore renewable energy. Richard. Thank you very much. I um, hope you can all hear me. Um, I will try my best to keep the time. So, um, yeah, so I'm a fellow in the college. Um, I hold an EPSSC Senior Research Fellowship in Tidal Energy, which is where I'm going to spend some, some of the time talking about and that's my main area of research. I'm also a co-director of the National Supergen Offshore Renewable Energy Hub, which is the Research Council's mechanism to try and coordinate and direct um, offshore renewable energy research uh, in the UK. So um, I've given myself quite a challenge. Um, I'm going to get through four different topics <laughs> briefly and quickly. I can see, yes. <laughs> Qu quickly. So I'm going to spend most of the time talking about wind, because uh, it's the most important. Uh, this is where I work mainly, tidal stream energy, which is underwater wind turbines, if you like. This thing's on dockside. It's going to get dropped in the water, and then a current will go past and make those blades turn and produce energy. And very briefly at the end, I'm going to mention something about tidal range and then wave energy as well. Tidal range, I think most people are probably familiar with things like the Swansea barrage sort of plans. 
Um, it's, it's basically a head difference in water, uh, a bit like conventional hydro, but using the tides to generate that head difference. Um, and wave energy, we all go to the beach and we see these waves and are quite, I'm always quite impressed with that, so how much energy is in the waves. And it's very, very difficult to get the energy out, which I'll say a little bit more at the end. Um, we've all touched on this. Before I start um, actually talking about uh, offshore renewable energy, we've all touched on a version of this graph. Um, so this is some analysis from the Energy Systems cat Catapult and it's supply-demand analysis for the UK, moving on the timeline there from somewhere about 20, 25, 2030, a bit forward where we are now, up to 2050 odd. Um, and this is what we need to do. Well, this is a version of what we need to do to get to net zero. And we're actually off on the left at the moment. On the vertical axis, this is installed capacity. This is generation capacity. The UK currently has about 80 gigawatts of installed capacity of all those different forms, whether it's solar, wind, conventional gas, nuclear, the whole lot put together. We need to do two things. We have to, electri we have to replace the fossil fuels with, uh, with renewables, and we need to electrify all of our systems. And this has been alluded to by everybody. And actually that takes us, if I can point with this, that takes us from over here, 80 gigawatts off to the left, to something well over 300 by, 20, uh, by 2050. So it's not only that we need to replace the fossil fuels with, renew with renewables, we have to quadruple our electricity supply over the next 27 years. That is the scale of the challenge. It's absolutely enormous. This is uh, a, an analysis, and there's lots of different assumptions. You can get different flavors of this if you like. And you can follow your favorite renewable or your favorite power supply. And hydrogen's on here, and hydrogen, I think hydrogen's a nice big gray one at the bottom. That's great. Comes up there. My stuff is in here in water, wave and tidal comes up. All of those colors, you can follow any one you like, they all grow, and they all have to grow. The right-hand side where we get to, I mean, so th th there are three takeaways, really. There's an awful lot to do. Um, the mix on the right-hand side here has a lot of colors, and all that means is we just need absolutely everything. There is not a, I mean, in order to get to net zero, we have to have everything. The conversation really changed about three or four years ago. There was a lot of, there was a lot of conversation around, you know, this renewable is better than this renewable. Once we embrace net zero, the conversation changed, and we need absolutely everything if we stand a chance of getting that. So I will tell you about not absolutely everything, as much as I've got time for. Um, we'll start with wind, because it's probably it's the most important for the UK of the offshore renewable energy space. Um, and this gives you an idea of uh, where we are at the moment. I won't bore you with all the numbers. Onshore, we have about 14 gigawatts on, installed. Offshore, we've just surpassed that. We've got about 15 gigawatts of offshore wind installed. We have the largest fleet of offshore wind turbines in the world. Uh, we have about half of the European offshore wind turbines at the moment, just under half, 46%. Um, this gives you an idea of what's happened, if I can point with this. Um, back over, I can't point with this. Back over here, when this all started in the late 90s, up to where we are now, that's 2022, that's about right. We've installed about 15 gigawatts of wind turbines over about 25 years offshore. We need to install another 15 gigawatts of wind turbines over the next seven or eight years. And that's, and we're looking in total to get to about 100 gigawatts of wind energy by about 2050. The wind turbines are getting bigger. The wind turbines you see when you drive around, you think, oh, that's big. They're tiny. The ones offshore are absolutely massive. Um, average wind turbine in 2019 was eight megawatts. The ones, we're going to look at one of these in a second, the ones we've been designed and, uh, and prototyped at the moment are 14 megawatts. They're absolutely huge. That increase in size has really, uh, increase in size and scale has really, really driven down costs. So um, this, is the, this is the cost of wind energy. This is offshore wind at the moment. Uh, it's just under 40 pounds per megawatt hour. That number will be meaningless to most people, but it's basically parity with gas production in about 2021. 40, 45 pounds per megawatt hour is what you need to get to. Onshore wind is even cheaper than that. Um, I can't be my time already. Uh, no, 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 it's fine, it's fine. So we're down somewhere about 40 pounds per megawatt hour. Um, so this is actually cost competitive without subsidy, even at 2021 uh, electricity prices, etc. cetera. Um, fine. So looking around the world at a few different things, um, not just the UK, I mean, the same story gets repeated around the world. We're currently up to 650 gigawatts of production. We're heading towards a terawatt of installed wind capacity globally. Um, some really big players there, China, USA. The UK on this pie chart's over here, we're number, I think we're number six whenever this was done. Uh, so that's in total about 29, 30 gigawatts of wind power. And really what's driving all of this is this change in scale. We go from small wind turbines down here in the tens of meters, a few hundred kilowatts, to what we're doing now. The future is always changing here. We're into a few hundred meters 
and we're talking about 10 megawatt type wind turbines. This, this thing here, this is uh, General Electric's Halliard X 14 megawatts wind turbine. This is actually on a port side in Rotterdam. This is one of the factories that they built the towers. And um, this actually goes offshore. It's designed for offshore. Um, it is, the rotor size there is 220 meters in diameter. I did a Google Earth of the college earlier. And if you go from the front gate all the way to the back over there, it's just over 100 meters. Each of those blades is bigger than this college, OK? So I left the crane picture in here deliberately. This is how you get the blades up there. It's, I mean, this is a real challenge is actually the cranes to actually do this. So these things are absolutely massive. 220 meters diameter. It sits going to sit off the sea because you've got to have waves underneath it. The whole thing, 260 meters high. That's the bit you can see above the water. It sits in 30, 40 meters of water depth, another 50 or 60 meters of foundation beneath that. We're up to 350 meters total, all the way from the bottom of the foundation, all the way to the top. For those who don't know, the Eiffel Tower is 330 meters. This thing is the same size as the Eiffel Tower. It spins around all day long, producing electricity. It's the largest bit of turbine machinery that's ever been made. That, as an engineer, I find impressive. What I think is really impressive is in the UK alone, we're doing one of these every two days. And that is absolutely phenomenal. To get to the 2050 target and to actually produce the 100 gigawatts, we need to be installing four to five of these beasts every single week for the next 27 years. That is the scale of the challenge. And that's just the wind, and that's only part of it. So moving forwards, um, what's going to happen with wind is we have to go further and further offshore, and we go from 30, 40 metres water depth, and we go to 100 metres, 200 metres water depth, and we have to make everything float. So now that big structure's got to be on a platform that's going to bob around in the sea, and somehow you're going to make that work as well. Um, and that is, that is going to work. And there are, you can see this is, a, this is one off the coast of Portugal. Portugal, the, the water drops off very fast. They get down to 400 metres water depth quite quickly. So you have you know, a, a, lot, a lot of need to get to um, these floating turbines. This is quite interesting. I think I got the date wrong here, actually. This is 2022. Um, the Crown Estate Scotland did an auction round called Scotwind uh, last year, and they auctioned off uh, 25 gigawatts of production space uh, to companies, and 16 and a half gigawatts of that was for floating. So actually, we're going to go from these fixed bottom devices to the floating devices. Lots of different, you probably can't see that with a light, but lots of different types of device there. And I'm not expecting you to be able to read any of this. This is just the Carbon Trust's uh, tracker of actually the different technologies uh, going through and different technology readiness levels coming from prototypes through to 5 megawatts, 10 megawatts, 50 megawatts type installations. So there's an awful lot of activity within that space. So that's floating wind. I will now move to the tidal stream, which we're just going to take the same thing and we're going to put it underwater. And that makes it even worse because you've got waves, you've got turbulence, you've got corrosion and all sorts of things. This is the area I particularly work in. So what is tidal stream? It's obviously driven by tides. I mean, you've got the, uh, the sun and the moon at work, etc. This is a little heat map of the flow speeds around the UK. The yellows are the, the, high, the, uh, the high flow speeds, the purples are the low ones. Um, and what you get is accelerations around headlands between you know, Scotland and the, and the Orkney Islands, etc. You get these accelerated flow speeds, and that's where you want to take energy out from. Um, 10 gigawatts potential within the UK, but its key benefit is complete predictability. It's the only renewable that you can set your clock by. Okay? 100 years into the future, we know exactly how much energy is going to be there. The UK is the world leader in this. This was the world's first big turbine. This is in Northern Ireland, Strangford Lock, uh, 2005. And we wind forward and we see three bladed turbines being I say, dropped into the water, put into the water. And then uh, a couple of years ago, we've transitioned a little bit now. We're now into floating turbines. So we've done that trick as well. And this thing, I'll show you some more about that in a second. But that's the world's largest uh, turbine at the moment. It's about two megawatts. So lots of different places around the UK uh, for these things to be deployed. I, I won't go through all the numbers, but this, the story is the same again. The UK has the lion's share of the European resource, and the UK really is driving this forward. It's a very, very early stage uh, technology. It's only about 10, 20 megawatts total uh, deployed at the moment. And it's really about driving costs down. So actually, um, coming down to here, I've put far too much text here, but actually last year in July, uh, the UK government actually started supporting this financially through the uh, contract for difference mechanism. And this really now will be the driver that's these tens of megawatts of, of arrays deployed. And I put some pictures on here. This is the Morlays project. There's going to be some deployment there. This is the Maygem project in the Pentland Firth, and there's going to be some deployment there into the tens of megawatts. And that will be the first tens of megawatts of these devices deployed anywhere in the world. But it's all around getting the cost down. 
Um, and this is one of those nice cost curves of lots of predictions. And actually, this is the ORE catapult. Um, and they reckon we can get down to about £100 per megawatt hour. Really, the challenges in this area are cost, survivability, and deployability. And I'll just say a little bit about those before moving on. This is a nice picture. This tells you, this is obviously a, 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 an illustration, but if this is your turbine, um, you've now got this really nasty shear profile. You've got bed-driven turbulence. You've got waves. This thing's going to move around if it's floating all over the place. The loads and the unpredictability and the unsteadiness associated with absolutely incredible. So the, des the design criteria include extreme loading conditions, fatigue conditions, corrosion resistance, all those sorts of things. One thing that's uh, it's plagued wind as well, but one of the most important things is availability. You've got to have your device running, otherwise you're not producing any energy. So really, uh, there's been a bit of a transition over the last few years, or a partial transition, to actually devices that float on the surface. So this is a long, this is 72 metres long. These two wings will fold down into the water, and then these red blades will then start spinning and, and producing electricity. This is the, the, the two megawatt device. But really, this device is completely accessible, and that's its key benefit. It's all up, um, you can raise it all up to the water level and then get to it to do maintenance and improve its availability. This is the area I actually work in. I'm going to, one minute apparently. Uh, this is the area I work in. I work in uh, something called constructive interference where we try and actually uh, use it, turbines to interfere with each other to actually produce more power. And actually we developed some, some, some theoretical limits uh, about 10 years ago now that shows that you can actually go past the conventional wind energy limits, which is the bets, and you can go up to a much higher limit that we derived. Um, so actually, I will think then therefore I will finish with a nice little video, if this works. Oh, hang on, no, no, here we go. That was going to work. Here we go. Right, so this is actually us doing experiments, which is quite exciting. Um, so this is a big facility up in Edinburgh. This is very CGI-like. And these are some of our turbines designed for interference effects. And we push, uh, we, we pull the floor down, we pull them down into the water. The current will start in a second. You get some nice sound effects with them. And we play with the turbines, we play with the different speeds of the turbines, and we can change the, the, the pressure gradients in the flow, and we can generate more power. So by doing that, we can generate about 10% uh, more power. I might put the conclusions up. Yeah. I will skip through lots of things we weren't going to talk about, and we'll just look at the conclusions. Um, the conclusions are actually really that um, in order to get to net zero targets, we need all the entire diverse range of uh, renewables um, at our disposable. Um, offshore renewable energy, wind, wave, tide, the whole lot has a huge role to play. Wind is a massive success. We've got everything going for us in the UK to make the rest of them a success, but some really big challenges in terms of resource. Okay, thank you. So if I could just ask the other three speakers to come off the stage. And Richard, do you want to take a question? One yes, question. Yes. Is there one question for Richard while we're just getting the stage? There's one at the back here. Thank you. Excellent presentation, sadly curtailed by the hands of the clock, but never mind. Um, you mentioned availability. Uh, Sorry. You mentioned availability. Yeah. Scarcely a day goes by the Daily Mail, the Financial Times, whoever, is criticizing the national grid for making huge delays. I think 13 years was quoted this week for connecting a, a big solar farm to the grid. How does that afflict your technology? Um, in terms of the speed at which things can be developed and deployed? Sure, yeah. Technology, but how do you connect to the grid? Yeah. So I'll answer that in terms of wind, because it's the most mature of them. I mean, the other smaller technologies, be it, be it, be it wave energy or tidal, um, they're not sufficiently large enough yet to really worry about the grid connection aspect in that sense. In terms of wind, the overall process of designing a wind, plant, a wind farm, getting consent, and then deploying and getting connection is about 10 years. I mean, it is a very, very long time. But those wind farms are all in the two, three gigawatt type space. So there are a couple of large nuclear power stations in size. But there is a very long delay. Uh, there's a lot of onshore process that goes on. The first two or three years of a wind farm's construction is actually the onshore process of all of the, all of the grid side infrastructure and getting all that cabling and network in place. Is this good? Yes, this works. Okay, so now is the time really to ask questions of the, the whole panel and also hopefully to get some conversation going between them. 
I'll ask the first question, but then please do think of, is there, if there are questions that you'd like to ask. And my question really is that, I mean, all of you, I can't hear, all of you are very convincing, but what do we need, what would you need to actually scale this up for this to actually fit into that net zero target that Richard put up at the, at the end of the you know, how much longer and how, you know, what, what, yeah, what, what, what do we need? What resource do we need? Yes. Money? Money. <laughs> I, I think that's, that is a, um, so we're talking about a grid. We, we, yeah. have, we have fundamental problems in the UK. The grid was built in the 1950s. Um, it is not suitable for 21st century. We've got, we've got fundamental infrastructure investment that needs to happen to enable all, all this stuff there. So, um, uh, yeah, we, we're fundamentally limited in that sense. I think that we, we, we need political will to understand the size of the challenge. Uh, we've done analysis, we, we just don't see how we get to net zero. These, these numbers of deploying, you know, how many wind turbines a week and solar panels, and this is not just the UK, this is across the world. UK, we've, you know, we're, we're doing very well on, on this whole stuff. The rest of the world is not. Um, this is a massive uh, challenge. So without the political will, without countries working together, this, this, we, we, this isn't going to work. Yeah, I think it's worth not adding. So you've got to remember, we're talking about avoiding a couple of hours of coal generation in the UK at winter peaks when there was not enough wind. And we currently globally build more new coal power stations than we've ever built. So like the, you've got to put it into context of the scale of the challenge we face, which is right now in most countries, in the developing world. Although wind and solar are cheaper, they don't create jobs in that country, so they'd rather build a thermal generation plant using coal that they have domestically and do that. That, that ultimately is the biggest challenge facing net zero rather than worrying about whether we're at you know, net zero every half an hour for the next you know, 20 years. But there's no mechanism globally to fix that problem because it, you know, no matter what you do, it's a very hard problem to solve, right? through coal right now and and you know what they've um they've uh, allowed the, the final quarter of their population to access electricity this had to happen yeah. ideally it shouldn't have happened through coal but yeah how do, how do we influence in things Germany, like just across the pond one of the richest countries in europe is burning more coal now than it's i want to say ever burned but you know a lot more than it did two years ago because it doesn't want any more russian gas even though the gas is much lower co2 now obviously there's a whole lot of other factors there but it's you know german coal is terrible as well because I think, uh, I think any technology needs to go to uh, normal phases and they have to be demonstrated and that is going to take time for any new technology. And uh, the question will be how to uh, really get there before that it will go to a scale up. And the uh, problem to validate any technology, it takes time and uh, later on the uh, scale up, it should be easy from a capital point of view, that's uh, our uh, opinion. If the permitting, uh, it will be much easier for new technologies to be able to uh, to start. I think it takes uh, for any uh, any of those projects more than two years uh, to get a permitting approved, and in the meantime, is the egg and the chicken situation. You might have the capital, you might have proven the the technology, the capital is ready to be deployed, but then you cannot uh, use it because you don't have permits uh, to uh, to build the, the facility. I think the, the other point I'd add, actually, I mean, the, the, um, uh, the drive for net zero, and this is a very sort of parochial look at it in the UK and the, and the developed world, um, but it is a huge problem in, in, in other countries um, that, are, that are trying to improve their, their living standards, etc. Um, part of the problem we've got at the moment is resource. And the, at least in offshore renewable energy in the UK, uh, Renewables uh, UK has worked out there were about 100,000 people short in terms of delivering. And that's 100,000 people across engineers, lawyers, accountants, it's technical skills, and lots of things. And that's in, in, in an educated country uh, to try and deliver these things. So actually, it's as much about capital and permitting as actually about people. And I, I would say this as an academic here, it's actually really, I mean, it, it's our students, we've got a few of them in the back, that are actually going to be doing a lot of this stuff over the next 20, 25 years. It's, it's their generation, our generation, that are going to have to be full throttle into delivering this. Yeah, that's, uh, we agree with that. This is, uh, for us, last year, this uh, a small company, they, for us to hire 71 employees in the six months, 
And we had to go out and open up an office in Malaysia, in Kuala Lumpur, because it was totally impossible to find engineers here in the UK. Right, we've got a question here, and then we'll take another question here. Thank you, so very interesting um, discussion. Um, question about money. I mean, this is clearly the heart of everything. But have some sympathy for the investor and for the government, the taxpayer, because they're looking at this multiplicity of different technologies, all having their different trajectories, their different potential returns, and the time scale, plus the risk or opportunity for new disruptive technologies. I mean, not only you talk much about storage, but obviously if there's a breakthrough in storage, that changes the balance. So it's incredibly difficult to think, and you're sitting here thinking, where am I going to place my investment uh, check in, in, which, in which area? And the government, um, and you can probably tell me this, the government has spent, uh, the UK government spent considerable uh, millions, billions on magnetic fusion the joint European Taurus has been up in column since time immemorial. Apparently, it, spends, it uses 4% of the electricity national grid output when it runs. It still hasn't got anywhere near the gain. And I think even, by the way, to, to dispute your gain figure, I suspect that was the Lawrence Livermore laboratory experiment before the end of last year when they got a positive gain. But apparently that was not taking into account the energy used to drive the lasers, but you can perhaps put me right on that. But the real point here is, you know, every, every different technology will say, we need more money. And, you know, some of them have a 10-year horizon, some have a five-year horizon. The, the return, the potential return on some of the investments are very different. I was looking at the BP results recently, and they're talking about, as you know, they've scaled back their commitment to renewable investment because their, their estimation is the return on every pound they invest in renewables is somewhere around 6%, whereas every pound they invest in hydrocarbons is at least twice that. So trying to figure out, you know, for the, you know, un you know the initiated and never mind the uninitiated, how, how do you actually approach this? There's a finite amount of money and, you know, nuclear fusion is very attractive because potentially it could blow all the other technologies out there, but it's always 10 years ahead and it's already spent, we have spent so much on it. So give us That's some guidance to the poor. Um, with the checkbooks and what, how they spend that I, sure. I agree. I'm going to take your mic for... Could, could, can you address that question? Yeah. I'll address a little bit to the from A. Okay. Um, and not necessarily about a private investor or, or, or anything else, but actually from a government perspective about what you invest in. Um, the UK government has done something quite spectacular in Contract for Difference, um, which has been... Uh, for those who are not aware of it, it's basically it's, it's an insurance mechanism um, uh, where there's a guaranteed fixed price where you produce something, uh, you, you, you produce electricity, you get a fixed price for it. Um, that's it's about as simple as it gets. And it's a de-risking mechanism. So actually, a lot of the way to reduce cost, it was all around de-risking. Um, and the UK government were absolutely spectacular in this, and they've been, um, um, uh, it's been acclaimed by the, by the European Commission as being the, the right mechanism for technologies that are developed and are mature enough to, uh, be it PV and wind, etc., that are mature enough to be actually be on the uh, to benefit from um, that that risk proofing when they're in the generation stage. What it doesn't help with is the emerging technologies, and actually that's something we're now missing in the UK. I think is the is the funding mechanisms to actually support emerging technologies that have to be much higher risk. Um, th there have been some in the past. I can't remember all all the acronyms, but that, there have been some mechanisms. Uh, I'm at pass over to dispute other things. Sure, so, uh, yeah, you're right. Is having, having markets for, um, um, with, with um, setting the returns for things is very important. I would um, take huge issue with BP in their numbers there. Uh, they may uh, double the return uh, for their hydrocarbon investments versus renewable investments, but that's because the market is fundamentally broken. The costs of what they're doing are not accounted for. So I suppose that talks to the carbon credits systems as a way to potentially start to tackle these kind of things and you know actually give investors a, you know, a true no, true return yeah, yes they can actually make double what, that's what they're saying uh, in the current situation so um yeah there's, there's a broken um market uh, that needs to be addressed you know bp have made the most incredible profits now and they still don't feel incentivized to do so that just tells us the whole thing is wrong um yes we, we need um 
future markets established through these kind of you know, contracts for difference or whatever the, 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 the mechanism are. Oh, there's some bad ones. Nuclear has some crazy kind of mechanisms which I, I don't endorse at all. Fusion, we think we can be cost competitive without carbon credits, without any of these kind of things. You asked me about the, um, the results. Yes, that was target gain at Lawrence Livermore. But that was with an underpowered laser. They couldn't, the laser's too expensive. They could not afford a laser. They wanted to do the job when they wanted to do it. And ultimately, Lawrence Livermore is about weapons stewardship. It's not about energy at all. What they did, though, they have a burning plasma in their target. With a burning plasma, you can get whatever gain you want out of that. So yes, notionally, that is not system gain. That, that doesn't concern us at the moment. We think this is, this is a very, very important scientific milestone. Um, the UK has spent a lot of money on magnetic fusion. I would probably argue, actually, just as a science investment, it's probably pretty good um, uh, investment in terms of creating very highly skilled scientists. You know, will it, will it result in magnetic fusion power? We'll see. We, th we think it will work. It'll just take a long time. Okay. Right. I think we'll just have another question. I think someone's got the microphone. Just. I want to put a question to Professor because uh, the other three people they just a business. <laughs> and I looking at something has uh, triggered me. If you look at your uh, diagram about um, in the 25 years, how much energy we're going to put it in. I just want to all here, just for a second, imagine a, uh, use of the energy instead of growing become flat. This is different approach thinking. All this new manufacturing, engineering, everything what you're doing, trying to constantly to increase the energy use. I, I'm, as a professor, I'm, just, I, I'm sure you have the something very, look at your diagram. It's not just a little bit, it's a, there it's are a two, huge amount. There are two things. One is electricity and one's energy. Okay? In terms of electricity usage in the UK, now I believe that as, as per head of population, that has been decreasing as we become more efficient in what we use. A lot of that is actually around electrification, which is taking, um, it's, it's producing hydrogen, it's, 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 it's uh, domestic heating, it's electrification of vehicles, it's all of those things. It's actually adding up what we already do and putting it into one basket under electrification. So it's not actually necessarily increasing. I, I mean, there are many different scenarios and there's a big, there's a big error bar on the end of that. And the different scenarios that have been played out by the different uh, 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 actors looking at these things, anything from 150 to 300 gigawatts we need by 2050. But actually the, the vast majority is conversion. In the vast majority of applications as you electrify, you are more efficient than yeah. the fossil starting point. So the more we can use electrification for that, the, the thing we want, it will net be less energy than we had to do. We hadn't, didn't do the transition. But ultimately, I do think there's a point which is human solution to things is to do stuff right. Like air travel, it, it mm. has lots of negative climate and the, the climate impacts. But ultimately, I can't see us getting to a point where there is no more air travel because of lots of other reasons. So I suppose the so human solution to that is to find a technological answer to it rather than just to say, we're going to jettison it. We've never jettisoned anything that was better for us in a way. Uh, you should read Va uh, Vaclav, yeah. what's his name? You know, the, the world through the energy of the yeah. lens. Really, it's a really good book on that. In about five minutes, we're going to have a drink, and then we can discuss this over the drink. I think I've got a couple more questions, and then we will stop. Uh, Dimitri. Let me uh, revisit the issue of money uh, and the issue of economic efficiency rather than the supermarket efficiency of all of those nice things that I heard the wind, the hydrogen, the plastic, the nuclear fusion. When we talk about money, we talk about a budget constraint, and we talk about trade-offs and incentives. How do you assess if you change the hats, your business hats, with the policymakers' hats, the trade-offs between spending in, for example, public and private uh, partnerships, money for any of these wonderful technologies, rather than for the social unsustainable issues that economic policymakers are dealing with on a daily basis. 
tell us? At least in, in our case, is the, obviously after a few years of investing and uh, going through any type of cycle of uh, raising capital with uh, friends and families and then move into the other type of more the institutional type of money. But reality is that we operate our plans with uh, more than 45% EBDA on, on sales. Uh, we make money and this is, uh, at the end of the day, that's the best uh, answer uh, for new investments. And that is, uh, we haven't used any single penny from the uh, from grants. And uh, uh, we believe that is uh, what we do from a sustainability point of view is extremely important because it's really going to give value to many people that right now are living in very bad circumstances in many in many different places. So we don't think that uh, what we will be expecting from the governments, as I say, I keep repeating all the time, is clarity on regulations and uh, uh, for uh, the free market uh, to be able to develop. Tony. It's a statement really for Will, but a question, what do you think of this? Um, um, hydrogen, uh, it, hydrogen molecules are excitable little blighters. They dash around all over the place and bash into each other, bash into the walls of the, uh, of the container. And as you say, take up a lot of space. You also say that um, uh, we're not going to give up air travel very easily. Um, so let's go back millennia and um, when we stopped monkeying around and we got man's red fire, um, it served us well for millennia because it was concentrated, solid carbon. Um, and then about 175 years ago, um, we discovered liquid fuel and transport really took off. So from boats and trains using coal, um, it literally took off and we had air travel. Uh, now you take um, Iceland has uh, abundant geothermal energy and they're also extremely prescient. Um, they develop public transport using hydrogen but realised liquid fuels were better and they worked away about turn of the century um, and produced methanol. 2012 they produced a pilot plant of 4,000 uh, tons a year. The EU Horizon Fund um, has created a methanol plant in Sweden from waste carbon dioxide from a steel plant and one in Germany. So these are real plants really working and of course China's got in on the act and in 2002 it produced a, a plant producing 110,000 tonnes of methanol and another one to, in 2023. Now, methanol, um, amongst other things, um, apart from the fact that it, it um, powers all the drag cars and um, drag racing cars and the Indianapolis um, 500, um, it, with precision fermenta fermentation, can, um, uh, can um, produce superb protein mixes. Um, it takes up one seventeenth. Did you ask a question? Because, uh, it's, it's fine, but we've, we're so short of time. Yeah. Seventeenth of the land, um, Drax um, power station can generate enough uh, from its CO2, enough uh, methanol for 300 million um, eight hour flights a year, passenger flights a year. Um, so my question is, would you consider, and I've got a paper to give you, would you consider um, looking at turning hydrogen into methanol from waste carbon dioxide? General, so right, so electricity to liquid-based energy carrier, there's lots of different options, ammonia, methanol, sustainable aviation fuels, synthetic diesels. Effectively, what you do is you take hydrogen that you produce for electrolysis, so good for my business anyway, so I'm indifferent, and then you take a thing that you have to combine it with to make it back into a liquid, a source of oxygen, source of carbon typically. If it's not biological carbon, then you're not net zero. So we, do we have enough biological carbon dioxide sources or carbon monoxide sources to produce that thing? It fundamentally, I see liquid-based synthetic fuels playing a major role in the future energy mix, but... By definition, they will cost a lot more than the fossil version because you have to take the electricity, go through two, I think it's two leaps thermally to get there. 
So there will be a premium thing. So air travel will definitely use it. I, I cannot, I, I mean, I used to work with Zero Avia. We provide hydrogen for their plane. I really struggle to imagine long haul, hydro, direct hydrogen based flight. I think it has to get an sustainable aviation fuel route. But the question is, they're the only ones that can afford to buy the CO2 as well, ultimately. That's where the CO2 market will go. Because no, you can't make sustainable aviation fuel using fossil-derived processes for the CO2. So something like Drax. I mean, everyone knows what Drax do with Canadian forests, so let's not use them. <laughs> there, that, that, that's, for the, that's for the next conversations. I think there's a lot of talk about whether ammonia would be the vector yeah. to transport hydrogen molecules. Ultimately, at the moment, the range of process of producing ammonia and coming back to hydrogen is very inefficient. So if someone can solve the kind of cracking of ammonia to make it viable, um, it's also a fifth as energy dense as liquefied natural gas. So although it is much better than hydrogen, it is still 5x worse than natural gas in terms of moving energy around. So to build an economy using ammonia like Japan's strategy for your careers, I think, is really challenging. I think in terms of could you use a premium applications, or semi-premium applications? Yeah, you couldn't make aluminium. Do, do you want to have a quick answer? I, I, I was going to say one other thing to add to that. I mean, one of the things around energy vectors is a lot of the um, renewables, the offshore ones, as you get further and further offshore, the cabling becomes a real problem, the cabling costs. So actually, the, this double transmission into an energy vector and then back again can actually be quite quite an attractive route to actually land the energy. Well, then Michael will be right. Right, okay, we're not going <laughs> We can have a long discussion. There's a, another question here. Your thoughts on uh, what's happened in the US, which is this Inflation Reduction Act, which really is about renewables, but the setting the end point for two products, hydrogen at three kilograms, uh, $3 per kilogram, and setting a price also for carbon capture and sequestration, or carbon sequestration at $75, and being completely technology agnostic. So that's going to cost over 10 years, $368 billion. It's already uh, impacted about $20 billion worth of new investments. Looks like another 20 in several weeks in, in the pipeline. Uh, you know, versus what's happened in Europe and the UK, where we've subsidized effectively the consumer, but spent 550 billion euros over the last uh, year. So. Any again, lots of great things that you've shown, but isn't it better to let the market look at a technology agnostic approach and set the endpoint? Interesting point, and this I think is uh, clearly uh, technologies in the based in Europe are going to be thinking the, if they will have to continue deploying capital in Europe, or they will go and take the opportunity of uh, be able to to build quicker in the USA because of the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. Um, they, I'm hopeful. I think this has just opened up a Pandora uh, box. Uh, Europe is going to react next Tuesday. There will be uh, different announcements. And hopefully that will simplify the processes for companies to be able to scale up technologies. But unfortunately, not with the uh, objective that you were describing of setting up uh, prices uh, in the long run that will make uh, technology agnostic uh, type of evolution. So we are going to continue trying to put barriers uh, for the technology development by trying to regulate them before they could be able to grow up. I think we should stop. I think our panellists have done a fantastic job. We could carry on discussing this for a long time. There is alcohol <laughs> or whatever you'd like to drink at the back there. I just want to thank all four of you for all of you giving such accessible talks. I'm still not sure which one I'd put my money against. In, pa in fact, all of them, all of them, all of them, definitely. <laughs> Clearly, your diagram showed that at the end. <laughs> I'd also like to thank 91, who provided the sponsorship for this event, and we're deeply grateful for that. This is the first of our conversations. If there's a burn burning question that anyone in the room would like answered along these lines, please let us know because the whole point is to really take those questions that often aren't addressed and just actually spend an hour or two talking about them. So if we could give a round of applause to our panelists and please join us for drinks. Thank you. Thank you.